Good morning. I'm Bruce McLean, the state representative for the California Association of Regular Baptist Churches, and it's my privilege to explore the Word of God with you this morning. And the theme that I want us to explore is the headship of Christ, the head of the church. Is he really the head of the church? And if he is, is he also the head of your life? When we think of the church, sometimes we think of the local church, and sometimes we think of the universal church, the saints of all ages from the day of Pentecost to the rapture of the church. But Christ is the head of both. And how important is a head? Can your body survive without a head? Someone has said that the human head is home to all of the body's major sensory organs, and the most important of these is the brain. Although the nose, ears, tongue, nerves, and other parts are important, without a healthy brain, they'd all be useless. Encased in the skull, the brain is the body's centralized conveyor of all information. Can an organization survive without a head? Can you live in an apartment complex and not know who the manager is? Have you ever played on a team and not known who the coach was? Or worked in a, a factory or some other context and not known who the boss is? So can a church survive without a head? Can a church thrive without the right head? Now all churches have elected officers and leaders. And they give leadership to the church. But who ultimately is the head of the local church? Most believers would readily identify Jesus Christ as the head of the church. Based on the declaration of Christ himself in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And the proclamation of the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1, 18 and in Ephesians 5, 23, that Christ is the head of the church. And so we clearly understand that Jesus Christ has the position of headship. And because he is the head... All who are members of the body of Christ are to be in submission to him. But not all seem to know that or put that truth into practice. And I'm not saying that it is a problem in this church, but I'm saying that it can become a problem in any church. Beyond that, there is an issue of, that impacts each one of us who are part of his church, his bride, his body. Do we see him as our head? And maybe that is the more important issue for us. Who is our head? Not just in the context of the organized church, but in the heart of the redeemed members of his body. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul develops this great truth under two major themes. The reality of Christ's headship and the response to Christ's headship. So I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading in verse 9 and conclude in verse 18. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins now here's the text that deals specifically with the headship of Christ. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
The definition of headship is this. Christ is the chief and the leader of the church. He is the one who governs and guides the church. It's a position of prominence and authority. And Paul here gives a defense of the headship of Christ. First of all, with his deity in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. This key word here, image, refers to a likeness as an image on a coin. It may also refer to a manifestation, that is, a revelation of what something is, a copy, an embodiment, a living image. So image implies the illumination of the inner core and essence of an object or person. In this case, that person is God. Christ as the image of God fits both of these meanings for image. He is the exact likeness and the embodiment of God, revealing to men what God is like. It's a portrait that captures the soul. It's a, like a child who is like his parent. And then Paul deals not only with the deity of Christ, but with the supremacy of Christ, verses 15 through 18. He's the firstborn over all creation. That is, he was here first. For by him all things were created that are in heaven that are, or that are on earth. He made all things, and we think back of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and John goes on to uh, explain there the place of Christ in creation. And you may remember what he says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. We know that Christ was there in creation. And he says, by him all things consist in, in Colossians. That is, all things hold together. He is the one who keeps creation operating. And then the resurrection of Christ is the third aspect of Paul's defense of Christ. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The importance of of the resurrection of Christ cannot be overstated. Without the resurrection, we are people without hope. It is the resurrection, Paul said to the Romans, that declared him to be the Son of God. Verse 1, 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. It's the resurrection that shows that everything that Christ taught and that Christ promised will be fulfilled in Christ, that he is legitimate. And without the resurrection of Christ, Paul says we would, of all people, be most miserable. We would be hopeless because of all, all the hopes that we had, would have had in Christ would not have been fulfilled if Christ had not been resurrected. So the resurrection of Christ is a, a great uh, proof and defense of his headship. So the supremacy of Christ as the head of the church cannot be doubted because he is deity, because of his role in creation, and his continuing rule over creation as well as his resurrection. He is supreme. This is the reality of his headship. But how do we respond to his headship, to his leadership, to his rule over us? We are not owners in the local church. We are stewards. And stewards have someone over them, and that someone is Jesus Christ. So, let's think about the response to Christ's headship. A survey of the New Testament reveals some specific attitudes and actions in response to the headship of Christ. In Colossians 1.18, we have this phrase, that he might have the preeminence. This phrase describes the purpose of God in order that in all things he might have the preeminence, that he alone might be supreme among all, the sole head of all things. Paul's logical argument continues into verses 19 to 23. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, 
And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved from the, away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister." Paul's reasoning is that there are two grounds that affirm Christ's supremacy, his deity and his work of reconciliation. His deity, in verse 19, it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, the fullness of the Godhead, and then his reconciliation of bringing man and God back into fellowship with one another, having made peace through the blood of his cross. There is a, a man in the New Testament that we are told wanted to have preeminence. He's an example to us of someone that would be a, uh, a poor example for us, an example of just the opposite of what we are to be. And that is uh, a man found in the book of 3 John and the ninth verse, a man named Diotrephes. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, and it's one word, he loves to have the preeminence, the same word for preeminence, but added to it is a word for love. He loves to have the preeminence of, among them. And John goes on to talk about some of the problems that that created. But here is a man because he wanted to have the preeminence, was not a good steward in that church. He was uh, going against what God wanted to accomplish in that church and in the life of, of the Apostle John. Christ said, we are ones who are not to love to have the preeminence ourselves, but we are ones who are to love to give Christ the preeminence, to understand our role as servants, our role as members of the body and not the head, as stewards and not owners. And when we accomplish that, we will be reflecting the reality of Christ's headship in a very practical way in our own lives. So Christ is preeminent. The, the, the second response is in Ephesians chapter 1. The body is subject to the head. And of course we have a lengthy explanation of that in the book of Romans uh, and in the book of First Corinthians, but I want you to think about what he says here in Ephesians 1 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. While well, 1 Corinthians 12 discusses the functioning of the members of the body with one another, this text makes it clear that all who are part of the body are subject to the preeminence of the head. And that submission means obedience. So as we obey the word of God, we display submission to God the Father, and we sub, uh, display submission to Christ, the head of the church. So the response to Christ's headship is that Christ is preeminent, that the body is subject to the head, and then the body is to become like the head. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Into him declares the growth of Christ's likeness. R.A. Knox points out that a baby's head is unusually large in comparison with the rest of his body. As it develops, however, the body grows up in due proportion with the head. And this author says, Paul may not have had in mind this physiological analogy, 
but it is instructive nevertheless. We are to grow up in the body so that we, we reflect the glory and the majesty of the head of the body, who is Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 says we are to be conformed to the image of his son, the image of Jesus Christ. Let me find that and read that for you to remind us of it. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Conformed to the image of his Son. One of God's purposes in redemption, one of the eternal purposes in the plan of salvation, is that we who are part of the body of Christ would be conformed to the image of the head of the body. Conformed to the image of his Son. There are times in, in nature where we have two-headed animals because they fail to separate uh, and in, uh, in the process of, of uh, birth and, and, and development before they were born. And, and while we recognize that that is a possibility, we recognize that is not the uh, normal situation. And for a church to say we have two heads that there is a head that is equal with Christ would obviously be more than saying, well, this is just an exception to normality. It would be a direct uh, violation of God's instructions to the church. When I was in high school and, and a couple of years as college, I worked in a machine shop which also had a manufacturing aspect to it. And so there were uh, different departments of this uh, uh, organization and this uh, industrial complex. And when I would go to work uh, after school in high school or during the summer when I was uh, home from college, one of the, the things that uh, became confusing for me was that there were sometimes somebody in one department that thought I was their employee and sometimes a person in another department that thought I was their employee. And as a result, I had multiple bosses, and there were times when those instructions uh, conflicted. I could not be doing something for one person at the same time I was trying to do something for another person. And so finally, the owner of the business said, look, you've got to be responsible to only one person. And so he named one person that always was the one who would, I would be responsible to, and that made it much better for me because I knew who the head would be. I, I've known people on athletic teams that would have more than one coach. And when those coaches give you conflicting information about how to do something, it's very confusing for the athlete. Well, if in the church we are not sure who the head is, we understand that that is very confusing. And so if we settle on the fact that Christ is the head, it clears up a lot of fuzziness that sometimes can occur in a local church. So the headship of Christ applies to all mankind because he is cre the creator. In fact, let me read from Philippians uh, 2, just to uh, set that in our minds, uh, that Christ is the head of all creation. Philippians 2, verse 9, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Lord has the idea of being the one who is the head, the one who is the authority. However, this supremacy is more personal to us who are his body, his church. He is our head in a very personal way. We are subject to him. We carry out his work in his way and for his glory. So who is in charge in the local church? It is Jesus Christ. Which brings me to a final question for you. Who is in charge in your life? Who is the head of your life? That's the personal application. That's the personal decision that we need to make. Who is the head in my life? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that your word is clear that 
Christ is the head of the church, that he is also the head of our lives. And I pray that in all that we do, we will submit to him. And as we study your word and as we walk with you, as we fellowship together as a local church, that we will grow in grace and knowledge and learn how to be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.